Okay. <laughs> we are back live again, and I am really having some uh, technical challenges here on the original live stream. Um, it said I had an unstable connection, so I have restarted the live stream on a new stream. So I'm um, going to give a little bit of time to see if people can find their way here. And I'm having an additional technical challenge that it's not allowing me to do this on my webcam. It's using my internal computer camera, which is frustrating because I don't have as much control over that. <clears throat> it seems like every live stream I'm destined to have some kind of technical challenge. So let me see where, <laughs> where I am. Thank you for your patience as I try to figure this out. Um, okay, uh, why don't you chime in and say where you're logging in from and can you hear me? This is a little bit of a tech disaster. Um, I'm not actually sure where the camera is <laughs> on my monitor so that I can actually look in the camera and not look like I'm looking sideways. Okay, oh, it looks like it actually is using my, it is using my webcam. Okay, I apologize to everybody who's hanging around and watching the start of this and not um, getting any good content as I figure out what the heck is going on here. Okay, I have feedback, I can see and hear you. I'm gonna jump right in here and just pretend that none of these tech challenges has happened and I'm gonna hope that everybody who is waiting, uh, has been anticipating this can find the new live stream here. Um, let me see if somebody wants to put a link to the live stream in the Facebook group, that would be awesome. But I think other people are gonna go over to the other live stream that I had to end because of a connection problem and not see this one. But I'm just gonna get going ahead anyway. Um, and hopefully more will join us. Okay, I've got a couple people on here now. Thank you for your patience. I'm Dr. Natalie Masson with Fertility from the Soul. I have this YouTube channel where I'm sharing lots of free resources to help you at different stages of your fertility journey. And today we're gonna to be talking about a topic that nobody really wants to talk about. It's not an easy one, it's not a light one, but I'm gonna make it as light and easy as we can and still get to the things that are really meaningful. So, um, this is so important that we address this because you've probably heard the statistics that um, pregnancy losses are very common, more common than people realize. And then when these things might happen to us, we don't know um, how to, um, it, it just kind of blindsides us and catches us by surprise. And we don't know how to support each other through these things. We don't know how to navigate them ourselves. And it's not something that's really a, uh, dinner conversation kind of thing. So we're left not knowing where to go and how to cope. And this isn't just about pregnancy loss. We're talking about fertility. So there can be many stages of loss and grieving that we're looking at. It could be um, the grief around um, not being able to get pregnant. This is sort of a silent grief that doesn't get talked about very much. People who aren't in this situation don't understand how much there's a an impact of essentially a monthly recurrent grief cycle when you're hoping to get pregnant and it's not happening. Um, there's another impact um, of grief and loss in the um, fertility realm that doesn't get talked about a lot. And that is what happens when you get pregnant um, again, if you're lucky enough to get pregnant again, and you have all these um, emotions and fears about what's going to happen with your pregnancy. So I posted recently in my uh, private fertility, uh, getting pregnant naturally fertility group, and I asked if this is something that people wanted to talk about. Now, um, people, somebody outside of 
our niche. Okay, this is my husband. <laughs> I mentioned to him that I was going to be going online to talk about grief. And he said, oh, I think that's a terrible idea. I don't, it's just not, it's uplifting, it's depressing. <laughs> I said, well, I asked in my group and actually the response was overwhelmingly, yes, please talk about this. So I understand in a different way than he does what we women are going through on this journey. So I had a feeling that this was actually something that could be of value and interest. And I'll share with you without sharing any names, because I like to protect privacy when people are posting in my private group, not assuming their name's going to get called out on YouTube. I'm going to share with you some of the posts that um, came in response when I asked if this was a topic that people wanted to hear about. <clears throat> um, I would love it if you'd address the fear one can sometimes feel at getting pregnant or even the thought of getting pregnant following pregnancy loss. We'd love to have a child, but I also feel a bit scared of being pregnant after having experienced pregnancy loss. If you can relate to any of these things that I'm reading off, please just type that in the chat. I can relate. I, I get that. Another poster said, I've had three losses. Each one ripped me apart. It's uh, been over a year long of trying to put the pieces back together, the trying and then being disappointed each time. Also pressures from family for expensive fertility treatments. Can anyone relate to this? Somebody else shared, I go through the five stages of grief each month as I'm disappointed every time. Sometimes the grief is so heavy, I can't make it through the day without breaks to cry and everything else seems so useless and pointless. Every month I start out hopeful, but then sink into depression. My temperature drops and I know my period is coming. So that's what I was mentioning early on about there's a repeat cycle of grief happening when you're trying to get pregnant and it's not happening right away. Um, can somebody say, share in the chat, is the audio and video in sync? Because as I see the video on my own screen, it's out of sync. Is Are we in sync? Can somebody just type in sync or out of sync? Because if this is out of sync, that's going to be really uh, hard for people to watch. <laughs> can you tell me, Are you? am I in sync, my video and audio? Looking for a response in the chat. Are my lips moving on time with the sound or is it slightly offset? Somebody could type in the chat, that would be great. It's working, okay. It's off on my monitor, but that's okay. I'm just not gonna watch myself, that's very confusing. Okay, another poster says, um, uh, yes, please, it would be great to talk about grief. I had a pregnancy loss in December, 2019. We've just started to try again in February with no success so far, but it was the only first try, only the first try, so I'm still hopeful, honestly. I'm quite confused about how I will feel when we finally will be successful with the next pregnancy. How is it possible to be happy with a new baby's development without being scared of another possible loss at any stage? Thank you for your answer in advance. So we're hearing a repeat theme here, right? Even, um, even if you get past the prior loss, what happens with the next pregnancy? Uh, another poster says, I find the disappointment each month very difficult and the grief of not having a second child is sometimes overwhelming. And it's often difficult for people outside of this situation who aren't in your shoes to understand, even if you already have a child or maybe a few children, the longing for another uh, not being able to achieve that is still very painful. Another poster, I have had multiple losses and it's still hard to deal with. And this is somebody that I know is currently pregnant. Um, and one more, uh, I'm in fertility treatments after two miscarriages. Tomorrow is the big day, trial number three, and everything comes up again. I tried believing in the magic without any doubt. I tried being cool and not dealing with it too much. And now I'm feeling I'm putting a wall on my heart so I won't get disappointed again. I feel I won't be able to deal with another miscarriage. And I'm told to trust, to believe, to be possible, positive, but how can I? I'm scared to be innocent and vulnerable, vulnerable again and have my heart broken. How do you do it? You know, and that captures so much. And that was why I chose this heart pendant to wear today because this is a very heart-centered, process, the, the longing to be pregnant, getting pregnant, if you lose a pregnancy, it's heartbreaking. And I don't, 
I don't find that in the medical community, there's really a lot of attention given to this. You know, in our uh, medical system, we really separate the mind from the body and the body is looked at as its own separate thing, but they're really integrated. And, you know, after my uh, first miscarriage, I know that I was going on and looking at statistics on Google. Does anybody else ever check statistics over and over again? Maybe <laughs> type in the chat. Uh, that's me. It's not an uncommon thing that we go looking for some kind of evidence about what is likely to happen, things like that. And one of the statistics that kept popping up in the top of the search about various studies on miscarriage um, and, and various statistics was one that I really didn't care to see, which was uh, the rate of future um, heart attack goes up for women who've had multiple miscarriages. And I don't say that to um, scare you, but to draw in this awareness of how much this impacts our hearts. And just yesterday when I was preparing to do this, I dug in a little bit to follow up on that statistic and see like, you know, how many studies are there about this and what do they think is the cause? Why would more miscarriages equal more um, later heart attack? And there were many studies and even a meta-analysis looking at many studies together uh, and confirming this trend. And when they went into the, what might explain this, I thought this was very interesting. What might explain this what they looked for as explanations for why there could be a correlation between these two things, they only looked at physical factors. They looked to see, well, was there a history of certain kinds of medical things that might have caused both miscarriage and later heart attack? But what they didn't, it didn't even arrive in the discussion that maybe something about having multiple miscarriages might impact our health and our heart in a way that could make us susceptible to later illnesses. That wasn't proposed in any of the articles that I looked at. And I'll dial this back about 15 years. My first job, um, official job as a psychologist, psychologist after I got licensed was at an integrative, med med integrative medicine center in a healing hearts program for people who had suffered from heart disease and were trying to recover using natural means, you know, traditional medical means and healthy lifestyle change. So they were doing exercise, nutrition, and group support and yoga. So I was in charge of the group support where we would help them open up their hearts, connect with each other, and heal in that more emotional way. And one of the observations just anecdotally from staff who had worked in this program over the years, they would say, have you noticed how many of our participants have had heartbreaking losses in their lives? How many in particular had experienced loss of children, living children? And we never collect the data on this, but indeed when you looked across the people coming through the program and you heard their life stories, some of them had, many of them had really heartbreaking losses of um, children and other kinds of losses, but that one really stood out. And so it was interesting to me when they looked at the correlation between miscarriage and heart disease, nobody was thinking, well, maybe there's something that these losses does to our hearts. And this is why I want to prioritize having this kind of conversation, because I think there are a lot of things that we can do to help take care of our heart, to take care of ourselves emotionally, to take care of our soul in a way that not only is going to feel better, but is going to protect our health later down the line. So it's just a hunch that I have that all of these things are connected. So it's not just important for how we feel day to day, but it's important on an even deeper level, how we're doing in our overall health. So um, I'm going to just check the chat and see what's up here. Uh, Juliet says, in Chinese medicine, the heart is connected to the uterus. 
okay, this is what we're talking about. See, Chinese medicine is following a different set of assumptions altogether. They don't separate the mind from the body. And so uh, everything is, is integrated together. Um, okay, Sarah, I'm just, I wish you'd never said that. It's a stat I'd never heard of. And I did hesitate um, on that, on sharing that. And I'd even say, if you're, if you found your way to this live stream and it, you're at the start of your fertility journey and it's all um, sunshine and roses for you, I kind of want to um, preserve that for you because this might not be information that you ever need on your fertility journey, or it might be, and maybe you could come back to that at a later time. So this is really, this today is really geared toward people who have had these kinds of stressors and losses, and we're just going to face it head on. So what we're talking about with that statistic is really just um, evidence that this is real, what you're feeling when you have emotional challenges and distress around whether it's difficulty getting pregnant or a loss of a pregnancy at whatever stage, this is very real that you're feeling something and it deserves attention. It deserves your compassionate attention. And in this session, that's what I'm going to be talking about is how we can take care of ourselves and protect our health. So this is really meant to be hopeful and uplifting that there, when we're aware, so much of what I teach is about the benefits of staying aware. When we're aware, there are so many things that we can do to help ourselves and improve our situation. Oh, Sarah says it's kind of tongue in cheek. Yeah, <laughs> I've had four losses, so keen to listen. Okay, so um, yeah, and I and I honestly used to myself kind of look away from uh, when I was trying to get pregnant. I'd look away from the boards that online forums that were about miscarriage. I just I didn't want to go there in my mind, and I think that's okay if it doesn't apply to you. You don't need to go there in your mind. Um, but for those who have been through the, through it and are dealing with it, it's so helpful to be bold, be courageous, and look it in the eye and come together and say, where do we go? Where do we go now? Okay. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, part of my story and how it relates to what we're going to talk about today. And many of you, I know, have already heard my story, so I'll just be sharing little pieces as they relate. But I was um, 41 when, with my first pregnancy, and I was very blessed to have no challenges at all. So I was allowed to go along with sunshine and roses and be quite ignorant about any of this whole world. And then the next time I was trying to get pregnant, I was 44, eventually 45, and it was many months of trying for our second child, trying to fulfill this vision of a younger sibling for our daughter. And um, it became very painful over the months of wanting something and not being able to manifest it. And I started to learn more, go to an acupuncturist, chart my cycles, all these things to improve my chances. And after almost a year, I did get pregnant and I made it to the first ultrasound and there was a heartbeat. And I saw the statistics that once there's a heartbeat, there's only a 5% chance of miscarriage. I was like, all right, I'm good to go. We're, we're set. I didn't really hear the doctor say, you know, the heartbeat's on the slower side. We can't sense it really well. I was like, okay, we're done. We're good. Awesome. And I went on making plans and, uh, Two weeks later, I started bleeding and I had a miscarriage at home. And I, it, it was, it was so, um, what somebody said, it ripped my heart out. It ripped my heart out. You know, and I remember um, specifically, you know, being in the bathroom that night, um, everybody else was sleeping. I was going through this by myself and just the agony, like the, the deep, deep, um, heart pain and just the agony of, I can't believe this is happening yet. I know this is happening. I know what this is and there's nothing I can do about it. And oddly in that moment, I also had the thought, it was weird. Like I had this, 
observer self that said, wow, I never would have known anything about this pain without actually having this experience. And I'm going to be able to understand others so much better for having gone through this experience. And I had that thought simultaneously as I was in the deepest part of my agony. And um, I really do think that each type of loss, each type of grief has its own features. And um, by connecting with other people who have been through similar things, we're more likely to get the kind of deeper understanding that helps us move through these things um, and, and thrive. And this is really about not just, I don't really like the term coping with grief because it sounds like we're just carrying this thing around ourselves and tolerating it. I like to think more of thriving through grief. Like we're not going to get past it and move away from it necessarily, but we can still thrive even while we have this undercurrent of humanness going on. As long as, as if we get to live long enough, we're going to all go through various kinds of losses and grief. And that's part of being a human being, goes with the turf. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about, I'm going to gloss over really quickly the model of the five stages of grief. I'm going to go through it quickly because it's really out there a lot. It's You've heard of these stages. You've probably looked at summaries of them. It's not really any new information. Uh, there is a little bit of new information coming forward, though, which I'll tell you about in a second. But the five stages of grief was laid out by Elizabeth Kubler-Ross um, many years ago. She has since passed away. My post with my notes just fell down <laughs> under my table and I can't see it now. That's OK. I know what's on there. So the stages, what are they? Um, denial would be uh, is the, the first stage where we am pulling up my notes on the screen here. Denial is the first stage where we kind of go into a, a shock and a numbness. Maybe it's not a literal denial, like we don't actually believe it happening, happened, but the mind kind of freezes up and maybe goes into an autopilot to be able to cope and not quite face everything that's happened. And then another stage could be anger, where you're angry at who knows what, it, whatever might have been involved or just angry in general. And then there's depression, just that heavy feeling of sadness. Um, bargaining is a stage where they talk about, oh, is there some way I can get out of this hurt? If I could be a better person or it, it all can manifest as regrets, if only I had done this. Uh, and it, it's sort of about trying to nego negotiate your way out of the hurt. And then acceptance is a stage that has to do with moving forward with the understanding of what is and kind of creating life as it is without um, whatever that was that was lost. So one of the common things that um, the creator of this, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, was frustrated about, and her colleague, David Kessler, went on to uh, talk and teach about this quite a bit. Um, it, they didn't really want it to be thought of as linear stages, like you do this, and then you do this, and then you do this, and then you arrive at acceptance, and then you're done. These are really, I would call them more like features of grief. So the word stages really led people to think that you're supposed to move through them in a linear fashion. And really, it's just a circle, and not even really a circle. It looks to me like some people experience some parts and not others. They could go in any order. So I think of them more as features of grief. And I want to tell you a little bit about... Um, the colleague David Kessler, who um, picked up where Elizabeth Kubler Ross left off, um, he is. I don't know if you're seeing this backwards or not. Uh, maybe mirror image. The he has uh, written a book recently calling "Finding Meaning: The Sixth Stage of Grief," and he's touring around the country right now, doing book tour and teaching therapists about his model, adding on the sixth stage of grief. Now his story is really poignant in that he became in, interested in this area when he went through, um, well, as a young person, he was in his teens, he lost his mother and that had a huge impact on him. And he later went on to specialize in understanding grief and teaching people how to help others through it. And then 
just a couple years ago, his 21 year old son died of an accidental drug overdose. And that was another layer of discovery for him for what this kind of grief could be like. So from that, he discovered that it went beyond the five stages and he found a sixth stage, which is about creating meaning um, out of the experience that you had. So you can see that the way we look at grief, even as professionals, is constantly evolving. And what I like to highlight is a way to think about it that doesn't really attach itself, itself so much to these stages, but I'd like to boil, boil it down to a concept that I think is um, helpful to maybe just simplify it a lot of things. And that is a concept of validation. Uh, and I'll show you how this re relates back to the comments from earlier. Validation is about recognizing that whatever we're experiencing is understandable. And I think the five or six stages of grief helps to highlight that. There are all these different emotions that are gonna float around that are totally understandable. And when we, recognize that our emotions are valid. And the second piece is it's important to take time to nurture and listen to our emotions, whatever is coming up for us. It's easy when it's happy emotions. It's not so easy when it's sad emotions. So we want to be able to turn toward even the uncomfortable emotions and take care of them. And this is something that tends to be um, opposite of what is the uh, automatic reaction in uh, many of our cultures. Automatic reaction in um, American culture anyway is to try to make things feel good, try to take things that feel bad and transform them into something that feels good. And that came up in one of the comments that I shared earlier. Um, I'm told to trust, to believe, and be positive. How can I? So be positive is a common reassuring suggestion that's given to deal with things that are upsetting. And what I'm going to suggest is to not try so hard to be positive. And when something truly heartbreaking comes up, you can allow yourself to be more fully with the natural feelings that are coming up and um, really take time to nurture those feelings. Now that's easier said than done. And I have a lot of different strategies and tools for how we can go about that. And one of them I want to share today is something that I feel anybody can understand and relate to and apply right away. There are other things that I think are important for a long-term strategy for building your resilience to deal with difficult emotions, but those take time. And I have programs for those. My Seven day challenge is coming up in a couple weeks. And that is the introduction to a longer term program where I teach a lot of mindfulness skills for dealing with these kinds of things that we don't completely have control over, that we do better to kind of accept and roll with rather than just trying to flip them into something positive. Um, so I have longer depth programs, but I also want to share with you things that are bite-sized and easy to access now on your way to learning the gaining the long-term strategies. So this one, I'm going to relate back to a, a current event um, that's happened in, in my neck of the woods, but really touched a lot of people around the world. But it has to do with, I find across the board and any painful emotions let's talk about sadness because that's a big element of grief. Sadness and aloneness is a deeper suffering than sadness and connectedness with others. So sadness all by yourself is a deeper suffering. Sadness when shared and connected with others can be a more thriving uh, experience of that grief. So when and, and this is why it's so relevant in our fertility arena because so much of this becomes a silent struggle, a silent journey, because it's not something that you can easily talk to anybody about. There are lots of reasons why we're not just going to open up to anybody 
that I haven't been able to get pregnant for two years, or I've had three pregnancy losses. There's a lot of reasons why you can't just talk about that to anybody and get the support you're looking for. So it's important to find ways to feel not alone and to feel connected. And this is a big part of um, grieving that you often see in various cultures, different ways that we come together at difficult times and times of loss. So I want to share with you, I live in San Diego. I'm originally from Los Angeles. Um, so I've been in this area most of my life and uh, the Southern California area. And as most of you know, there was a very devastating um, helicopter crash back at the end of January, where nine uh, beautiful people passed away, including a couple famous people, uh, the most famous being Kobe Bryant, and his daughter, his 13-year-old daughter, was in the helicopter with him. So you know, whenever there's a well-known person that is highly, um, uh, who, who has connected with a lot of people, there's sort of a community-wide grieving. You know, everybody remembers who was alive then knows when JFK was killed. Um, that was before my time. I remember when Princess Diana passed away. I didn't really feel a connection with her, but there was a really a global grieving at that time. Kobe Bryant, I'm not a basketball fan. I'm not a sports fan. I knew who he was. Um, so I didn't have a personal connection, but um, a lot of people did, sports fans especially, people who grew up uh, inspired uh, by his um, his his persona and his role in the basketball game. But there's a human element, regardless of whether you knew him or how you feel about him as a whole person, because he has a complex legacy that he's led behind. And that stirred up a lot of um, uh, little dra mini dramas in media and social media. But looking past that and just looking at the human response to people coming together around a loss, um, I was up at my parents' place a couple weeks after uh, this event. And, you know, does anybody still get paper, newspapers? I, my parents do, okay? <laughs> it's kind of a relic of the past. Uh, and the sports section had this cover, which I think everything's backwards for you. This is Cello and Goodbye. So I don't know if you caught this. Did anybody see the actual memorial at the Staples Center? It was televised. So about a week after Kobe's passing was the next Lakers basketball game, and they had a memorial at the Staples Center, very large arena, um, to commemorate um, all those who had passed, um, particularly Kobe and his daughter. And the opening to that memorial was something, you know, when, when somebody passes away, it, things happen very fast. They have to figure out how do we properly memorialize this person and do it within a week because that's when everything happens. So they had a week to put this together. And one of the, the director of entertainment for the Lakers said, we're going to use the song, Hallelujah. Leonard Cohen, Hallelujah. If you have heard that song, it almost makes you cry no matter, even if you're not thinking about anything. It's a very poignant song, very, um, it has a very sweet, sweet, touching um, feel to it. So he knew that was going to be the song, but he didn't know what the instrument was going to be. He wanted it to be a solo instrument, and the guitar was kind of too thin, violin was too tinny, and eventually he came up with it's going to be cello. Cello has a deep, soulful kind of resonance, and they didn't know any cellists. They said, where are we going to go? So they went to the L.A. Philharmonic, and I learned all this from this article. I never would have known any of this, but I, I did watch parts of the memorial. And when I saw that, uh, I was just really, really moved by the artistry of it and the intensity of what it brought together. But anyway, they called the LA Philharmonic and said, can you bring us a cellist? And the lead cellist that they sent to do this, who had one day to prepare for this to arrange the score to match the video that was going to be broadcast over it was a man who had tragically lost his um, his ex-wife, the mother of his son, just a month and a half before. 
So I'm going to read a little bit of an excerpt from the article because it's, it really speaks to um, the collective sense of grieving. And so um, as fans around him wept, so finally did Hong, the artist, and the city united in a shared sense of loss, a basketball legend bonding a community one more time. I told my son I, also, I had also been playing this for his mother, he said. It opened up all those scabs of sadness. It only figures that on a night when the impact of Kobe Bryant was being remembered, that impact continued to grow. Um, I want to skip forward. It wasn't about, this is uh, the, the uh, musician speaking, it wasn't about the notes. It wasn't about the performance. It was a way to remember, to mourn, to cope with what we were experiencing, he said. The music was a beautiful way to process very difficult, very painful, very sad feelings. Uh, when he stepped onto the Staples Court for the first time in his life, he was overcome with awe. I felt entrusted with this higher purpose. I felt very honored, he said. I was playing for the memory of the nine victims, playing for the grief of the crowd, playing for everyone. By the time he finished, the roar from the darkened seats illuminated just how deeply he had reached everyone. I think we had exactly the right instrument and exactly the right performer to do that moment, the justice and grace that it had needed, Harris said. Through it all, the musician said he can't get Kobe's Bryant, Kobe Bryant's words out of his head. The ones from the video talking about toughness and resiliency and following your dreams. I was just a music version mirroring what Kobe said, he said. It was all about a sense of eternity, unity, and peace. And every breath we drew was hallelujah. So if you, I'll, I'll drop a link to this performance, this piece of the memorial um, in the comments afterwards. Uh, but I find music very powerful. Music really speaks to me. Um, and for you, it might be another form of art, but I think of art and music as a way to, that we can connect with universal human experiences. So maybe you don't have somebody that you can talk to who truly understands what you're going through specifically in this moment, but maybe you can find a piece of music or some form of art that resonates and tells you, you're not the only one who's gone through this kind of pain. There are others who experience this with you. And that's what that memorial in the Staples Center did. It brought a whole bunch of people together to collectively say, we're not in this alone, we're in this together. We feel the same resonance. And even the musician who was not a basketball star, a, a basketball fan, had his own grief that he could resonate with. So that is one of the things that I actually used after my second miscarriage. So I told you a little bit about my first miscarriage. Uh, three months later, I was pregnant again. And this time um, got to my seven week ultrasound and there was a heartbeat a little on the slow side. And by the nine week ultrasound, there was no heartbeat. So I was pretty beaten down by this point. And um, it was devastating again. Like the first time, you know, if you haven't been through this before, you think maybe after the first time you kind of get it, you know what it's about, you know what you might expect. And the second time, maybe, maybe it'd be a little easier. <laughs> it, it, it wasn't easier or harder. It was horrible also in slightly different ways. And I, I really felt like it was the end of my journey at that time. And um, I had a lot of feelings to process about everything that I had been through and about losing that pregnancy and the fact that I hadn't naturally lost a pregnancy yet. It was still inside of me and it wasn't passing naturally. <laughs> so it's very complicated. You know, every miscarriage story is a little bit different as to how things play out, sometimes even on a practical physical level. So I went home um, sobbing <laughs> that day from that appointment and I turned toward music. I didn't feel there was anybody really who I wanted to talk to about this in detail. Sometimes it's so hard to explain how you're feeling and to know that somebody's gonna meet you where you are. You know, I had 
discovered the first time that getting the right kind of feedback that really soothed me was really not that easy. And I turned toward music and I'm going to share a link to this afterwards um, in the, in the notes for this, but I turned toward um, a performance that I found on YouTube. I knew the song that I wanted to hear is called time to say goodbye. Conte Partiro in Italian, I believe. Um, and it was sung by Andre Bocelli and Sarah Brighton, Brighton, Brightman or Brighton. And, oh, I found a few versions of the performance actually, and I probably watched them a hundred times each. And every single time I would sob and, you know, the ugly crying and just crying and crying, boxes of tissues. And, you know, somebody created that beautiful, beautiful piece that had the words, that had the tone, that had the arrangement, that just captured the essence of time to say goodbye and a loss. And it's applied to so many losses of all kinds, to people in all languages, all cultures, all around the world. And I felt a connectedness there with the humanness of loss and suffering and um, Sarah, you know this song, you love this song, yeah. It, and this particular arrangement and performance, the, the, this duo went and performed it a number of times. So there are quite a few versions of it floating around on YouTube and they're all amazing. Um, but that's not about be positive and stay hopeful. That's about let yourself embrace what really is. And whether your loss is, this is my 10th cycle trying and my heart is being ripped out every 28 days, or it's my third cycle trying, or I'm 45 years old and I don't know how many, how much longer I can try anymore, or I've gone through a loss, first trimester, second trimester, whatever kind of loss. I encourage you to find some form of art, maybe it's music for you, um, that carries a resonance that reflects what you're experiencing so that you can just feel that collective connection and that permission to have these feelings. Now, this is, doesn't sound like a walk in the park because I'm not telling you that this leads uh, immediately to sunshine and roses, <laughs> but I really do feel that ultimately it's the only pathway through this is to have time to fully uh, embrace and acknowledge the depths of our human sorrows. And, you know, for me, I have since moved on to feel closure about um, what I went through. And I recognize, of course, that that closure is easier for me because I was able to go on and have a second su successful pregnancy. So the pathway for somebody who doesn't have that part of the closure is going to be slightly different, but it will also involve uh, to, taking time to nurture the very real human emotions that are connected to these kinds of experiences. So that's my piece of a recommendation, something to keep in mind that actually covers a lot of pretty sophisticated psychological principles that you can capture in just putting on some headphones or finding a video to watch with the performance. Um, and, and, and letting yourself let, breathe through that, cry through that, and letting that uh, move through and knowing that it's okay. Nobody else has a timeline for you for when you should get over it and be done with it. It's five years later now, and I can still go back to stories that I wrote about that time for me. I can I go back and listen to that same song. I did that last night, and tears are just coming down my face. Uh, you know, I, I think back about those moments when I was in that place of despair. I'm no longer there, but I can remember that and still the emotions come and that's okay. You know, it's fine. There's no timeline. I hear so often that people think they're supposed to be moving on by a certain point and real significant losses don't just go away and go, go rest in the past, especially if it was, if it's something very significant. And I've had what I consider bigger losses since then. I had loss of a close family member who died of cancer a couple years ago. 
And that's not something I ever expect to get over. I will grieve that over and over again. And, and that's okay. That's human. That's, that's part of loving and having an open heart is you're going to also have a broken heart. So we take the, the plus with the minus and just allow that to be part of our lived experience. Okay. Is anybody else connected with music or art to help them move through difficult times? Please share in the chat if that's something you have. And if you have uh, particular pieces that have been helpful for you, please feel free to share that in the chat because if it resonates for you, it might resonate for someone else as well. If you have any specific questions, please also put that in the chat. I am checking to see if anything's popping up there so I can answer any of your questions. Okay. So I want to speak to uh, also to what I would consider more the long game of dealing with um, challenges, especially when they're going to be um, repeated and ongoing. Um, well, any, any, any loss that's still kind of staying with you is something that's ongoing. And I don't have a, a, a two second solution, uh, to those things. Um, uh, there are things that you can do to, to soothe yourself. Like I talked about, I find the validation piece really helpful. Um, and then there's just sort of a mindset and actually somebody in the Facebook group posted a response to the question I shared at the beginning, one of the posters had just said, um, she's been through two miscarriages. She's about to do a fertility treatment tomorrow. That would be, oh, today she's doing it. Or maybe it's tomorrow. I think she posted it today. And she feels she won't be able to deal with another miscarriage. I'm told to trust, to believe, to be positive, but how can I? I'm scared to be innocent and vulnerable again and have my heart broken. How do you do it? And somebody responded very wise, response mindset that helps me is to uh, the mindset that helps me find peace is i will be fine no matter what happens as much as i want it to happen it is not going to be the end of the world if it doesn't you will survive and build your life again so this is a very much in alignment with a lot of what I teach in my programs, which is uh, more of an Eastern philosophy kind of approach to emotional wellness, which is based largely in um, acceptance, allowing things to be, not striving so much and not clinging to needing to feel good or pushing away feeling bad. So it's more of an allowing things to be as they are and finding grace and balance in being with the ups and downs. And this I find is the most effective, for me, the most effective approach when it comes to things that aren't completely under our control. So the getting pregnant, not completely under your control, having a pregnancy work out, not completely under your control. So I'm not a fan of stay positive, believe it's going to happen. If it, it, the harder that you believe, the more likely it's going to happen. I get very concerned actually that we're setting ourselves up and each other up when we tell each other things like that to feel like we messed up and didn't believe hard enough if the outcome didn't happen. So I don't, and, and this is somewhat belief-based but I don't hold the belief that if you hold your thoughts in a correct way, you will get the outcome that you want. I just don't believe that to be true. If that's your belief system and that works for you, more power to you. I don't want to take that away from you. But if you resonate more with the belief that sometimes unfortunate things happen, no matter what you do, there's that chance that things aren't going to work. Oh, well, if you ate all the right things, you thought all the right thoughts, you got all your energy into alignment and worked with the best practitioners, that doesn't guarantee that there's going to be a certain outcome. And what I prefer is to in, invest my energy into the resilience of um, being able to tolerate and roll with that there will be disappointments and even being able to thrive and enjoy life even when I'm aware that not all of my dreams are going to come true exactly the way I envisioned. 
that I can still have a rich and meaningful life, even if I experience tragic losses, if some dreams don't manifest, if tragedy befalls me. I ultimately believe that I will thrive and come out on the other side of that. And that's based on an ongoing practice of these principles of um, acceptance and kind of trust in uh, a bigger picture despite specific outcomes. So that is how that that is the style of mindset that I teach in my um, trying to conceive programs and my fertility support programs. It's woven in to all of my meditations that you'll hear on my YouTube channel. I don't like to get people too much up in their head thinking about the concepts. I like to guide them through just letting it in and experiencing it because once we get all mental about it, it kind of interferes with the experience. So I don't talk about things like mindfulness and that sort of thing in a lot of my introductory teachings. I save that for those who want to go deeper and really try to incorporate this as a lifestyle mindset, um, a, a mindset lifestyle, something like that. Um, so um, that's where I feel like there's a real opportunity. If you are feeling stuck because you don't know how to grapple with the ups and downs of the monthly cycles because you're so um, attached to a certain outcome that you're wanting to happen, I have programs to help with that long game of kind of disentangling that rigid attachment that puts us on this big emotional roller coaster. You know, and coming back to the health issues that we talked about, I really do think that um, there's probably a, a health impact to the trying to conceive um, rhythm of every every four weeks, we're going through another cycle of, of despair and devastation. And so one of the biggest accomplishments I feel that I've made, one of my biggest contributions to helping other people has been developing a program that helps people get out of that cycle of 28 day up and down despair while still trying to get pregnant. Now, once you decide that you're not going to try to get pregnant or you take a few months off, it's a little easier to get that balance because you're not on that cycle anymore. But continuing to try to get pregnant and getting to a place of more ease and balance in yourself, to me, is a huge accomplishment. I know how hard that is because I went through that myself. And that's a lot of how I developed my programs was based on seeing myself get completely obsessed and out of control with my own emotional balance. And that was when I started writing the fertility affirmations. And then I went on to incorporating all the mindfulness tools, the mind body tools that I use in my psychotherapy practice. And now I have that um, in a whole um, fertility, ongoing fertility program. And if anybody in the chat is in any of those programs and wants to chime in and say if that's helped you at all, that would be helpful to hear. Um, but I do get feedback all the time and it's the thing that makes me the happiest. Like I am thrilled when somebody says I got pregnant following, you know, using your tools. Thank you so much. I'm more than thrilled for them, but I have to say truly what makes me feel even more satisfied is when I hear someone say, I haven't gotten there yet, but I feel calmer inside. I'm enjoying my life again. I'm connecting with people in my life again. Um, people who already have children and have been in despair about not having another child say, I'm enjoying my current children more now. This to me is just like, th this is the biggest win for me that without the bonus of getting the pr big prize that we were after, we can also feel fulfilled and enjoy the life we currently have because that's the only thing we know for sure. We have no idea anything that's happening tomorrow and the next day, um, but we have what we have right now. And what, a, uh, what an awful loss it is 
if we're so fixated on what we don't have yet and what we hope to get that we miss out on the, the beauty that is around us right now. So that's what I'm most proud of in the programs uh, that I'm creating that has been manifesting. I, I can't be more happy with seeing that outcome transpiring. Uh, and Jenny K commented, I love the Conceive with Ease program. I love you, Jenny. Jenny has been with me from the start, uh, just about the start, uh, probably about six months after I created my started creating my first online course called the 90 Day Egg Nurturing Program. And that was designed to help women who were in the situation I had been in. I'd had two miscarriages. I was in my mid 40s and I took I, I, I invested in a few months to do what I thought would help improve my egg quality. And then I had a successful pregnancy. So I created an online program to help um, teach other people how to create a program like that for themselves based on their needs. Uh, so Jenny's been with me since, since that time. And one of the things I discovered while working through this with uh, women who were trying it out with me for the first time was that there was this mindset piece that I needed to take more time to teach. And that was when um, the, the mindset that I've been talking about, about how to let go of striving, how to be in the present moment, how to not be so attached to certain outcomes. That's easier said than done. Now, I mean, anybody can sit here and say, oh yeah, this is how you free yourself up. But doing it <laughs> is a different story. And I realized I had to slow down, not just tell people that, oh, go learn mindfulness. You know, um, I had to slow down and figure out how to teach these concepts in a way that actually work. And that was when I created the seven day TTC chill out challenge. I was like, let me see if I can do this in 15 minutes a day, just give people little bits of meditation practices to help them feel the potential for this kind of approach. I didn't really know when I first did it, if it would work, but it did. Like a lot of people were like, oh, in just a week, I feel so much better. So that led me to um, rinse and repeat that seven day challenge, but also add on four more weeks of practices for those who want to stay on for the membership. And that became the Conceive with Ease program. So that has that's the whole flow of the programs I've created. There's the seven day challenge, and then you can come into the Conceive with Ease membership. And then if that's working for you, you can continue on to the 90 day egg nurturing program where I teach a whole system for customizing your own egg nurturing program. So that's how it all came together. Thank you for being here, Jenny. You hold a lot of history with the development of the program. And I'm so glad that you're enjoying the program uh, yourself now. Okay, so that is a little bit of overview. I wanna come back to make sure that I addressed the, the categories of losses <clears throat> that people were speaking to when I posted the question in my Facebook group, and they said these were the things that they wanted help with. I want to come back to this and make sure that uh, Andrea is here. The 7-Day TCC Chill Out Challenge is really a beautiful program. Thank you, Andrea. I love your enthusiasm that you've brought into the program. So the categories excuse me, backing up just a bit. When we talk about grief, most people think about losing, um, losing, uh, uh, you know, some, something that you have, something that you had, maybe it's a friend or a relative or a pet. When we look at um, fertility, there are a few other features that are unique to fertility. So we have uh, I made it to three categories. Loss of a pregnancy at any stage is going to be a source of uh, grief. Um, dealing with a next pregnancy, leading up to it or being in that next pregnancy and coping with your fears about what if this happens again. And category three is when you're wanting to get pregnant and you're not getting pregnant. So this is this kind of um, invisible grief. You can't tell somebody what you lost because it's not something you had, but it's just as painful. And it has, to me, all the features of grieving something that you had and lost. It's something that you want to have, but can't get to. So things that I want to highlight about these three categories 
of grief within um, the fertility journey. Um, pregnancy losses, something that I want to point out here is it's, there, there are some particular complications that come up that make it extra textured, let's say. There's the one that comes to most people's minds, which is the emotional loss of the pregnancy. There's also a tremendous hormonal tidal wave going on when you're having a pregnancy and then going through a loss. There's a tremendous tidal wave of hormones that need to come into balance to adjust to what's going on. So that adds a layer of emotional turmoil to the whole process. And then there's also the physical aspect of what's happening with the loss. You know, before I went through it myself, I don't know what I thought would happen in a miscarriage. I, I, I just kind of imagined that you're pregnant and then you're not pregnant. I think my brain just didn't want to go there to ask somebody what actually happens. How does a pregnancy get lost. <laughs> it doesn't get lost. It doesn't just vanish. Something happens there. There has to be a transition of what was a pregnancy that is not a, a viable pregnancy anymore. I'm not going to go into that in this session, but it can have a lot of uh, complications as to what's going to happen next. So you've got three things going on. You've got the emotional issues around loss. You've got all the hormonal uh, tidal waves going on. And then sometimes you also have some complex issues around how that is going to roll out physically and how you're going to, um, how you're going to resolve this pregnancy and uh, come back into a healthy balance in yourself. So I won't be able to delve into uh, what all to do about those things. But what I want to say is to just understand that there, there are a lot of layers to unpack. And if you want to get some help and guidance with that. Working with a therapist who has experience in this field can be very helpful. Turning toward support groups where people have been through these things and can relate to it can be very helpful. Um, but just know that it's really complex and it's really not something people talk about much. In fact, I remember after my first miscarriage, my next appointment with my doctor, my OB, who was very, very kind doctor I'd been with for a long time, I mentioned to him something I mentioned earlier today. I mentioned, you know, there's a part of me that's thankful that I went through this because I never would have known all of the emotional stuff that goes along with this. And he paused and he said, and what I thought was a thoughtful way, he was like, oh, like what? And it was almost... The, the way he said it was almost like it never really occurred to him that there was this emotional component that goes along with having a miscarriage. And I've gotten this feedback in my Facebook group before that this is a pretty common thing that your doctors often are how, huh, clueless that there is an emotional component. So at that moment when you're most vulnerable and you're most in pain, the provider that's there with you is focusing on the physical stuff and has no understanding what the emotional component is. And I even remember my second miscarriage when I had that second ultrasound where there was no heartbeat, the nurse who was attending the session, who I'd known for over 10 years, she just afterwards, you know, she quietly slipped out of the room without saying anything. I don't think she said, I'm sorry or anything. She just kind of slipped out of the room. <laughs> so I, I just want to say that there are those around you who are not going to get how big a deal this is, but it is a big deal. It's a very big deal. There's a whole lot going on and there isn't enough support, in my opinion, woven into our systems. So really at this time, I just want to say it is a big deal and you do want to give yourself, figure out where you're going to get the support in processing and healing whatever you've gone through and, and, and don't have that expectation like it's just supposed to go away. And just because miscarriages are so common doesn't make them less painful. It doesn't make it, um, you know, like, it, it, and it's so funny because we don't say that when, um, with other kinds of losses, we don't say, well, people lose pets all the time. So somehow that makes it less significant. You don't say that if somebody loses a parent, you don't say, oh, well, people lose parent. That happens. 
it happens a lot. People lose a parent. It's true. <laughs> but we all know enough to know that that doesn't make it any less painful. But when it comes to miscarriage, I'm embarrassed to say I think I said that myself to a friend who was miscarrying before I had any clue about this sort of thing. I said, well, I've heard that it's actually really common. I, I was trying to be reassuring to her. I look back and I'm shaking my head like, oh, I said that, you know, <laughs> I was well meaning, but it, it does not, it, it's not, it's not a helpful message. Yeah. So if you've been through this, it's a big deal and connect with people who will validate that for you. It, it is a big deal. Any, any of these aspects of grief related to um, fertility. Okay. So the other category was um, how do you deal with um, working toward your next pregnancy or being in your next pregnancy with everything that you know now and the fears that you might have? And um, mm -hmm. that's part of what I consider the, the long game work to have that kind of mindset and resiliency to not be too attached to the outcomes and be prepared to roll with what's going to happen. The poster who said, you know, I've tried to just think positive and, you know, believe um, that can be helpful for some people. But if you're finding that that doesn't, that doesn't quite do the job for you, um, I think it's important to allow yourself to acknowledge that it, it is scary. You have been wounded. There's a, there's an element of trauma to, you know, having a loss, having it be painful, and then going right back into the situation that could potentially lead to the similar thing, right? Our, our, our system is wired to protect us from getting hurt again. And if you got jumped when you're walking by an alley, your system is going to go into an alert mode every time you walk by an alley for a while to say, this might be dangerous. Let's try to avoid this. We're very primed to try to avoid pain. So when we know that we want to get pregnant again, or we have gotten pregnant again, uh, intellectually, we know this is something we're choosing to move toward because there's something we're hoping to get to, but we cannot avoid that association that this is something that has led to pain before. So I would say, acknowledge that. Don't try to rub it out or criticize yourself if you're feeling some fear. Um, that's okay. And also have that awareness that these are separate, even though the brain might want to put them together as a repeat experience, they are separate experiences. And again, if this is something that becomes really tenacious for you, this is something that you could get help from a therapist with, and there might be some benefits to doing some even trauma processing type work with prior losses to help you separate out old experiences from new experiences. Okay. Um, Sarah says, I think I adopted the avoidance tactic, trying to avoid thinking about keeping by, by keeping busy, but I can see that music could maybe help. Okay. So avoidance is a strategy that has its trade-offs. Avoidance can be helpful to just say, oh, I'm not going to, I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to think about that. I'm going to think about something else. Um, so I would say use avoidance uh, to the degree that it helps, but recognizing that when you're getting overly avoidant and you can't do the things that you need to do because you're in avoidance mode or you, your, your thoughts become intrusive, trying to bring you back to something that needs attention, that's a sign that it's, avoidance is not going to work anymore. You need to turn toward and nurture what's going on inside of you. Um, Juliet says, a U2 song got stuck in my head. It just resonated with me. So I listened to it again and again. The verse is, you've got to get yourself together. You got stuck in a moment and you can get out of it. I, I remember that song. It was popular right around 9-11. And I would listen to that on the radio and I would just cry. I would just cry. There was another collective grief, right? Worldwide collective grief around... Um, uh, a really tr tragic, a uh, huge uh, loss there. So I love that YouTube song. If anybody knows the name of it, just throw that in there. Uh, I don't know the name of it. Um, okay, now the uh, third category, not getting pregnant when you want to be pregnant. And every 28 days, there's that roller coaster. Um, another issue that somebody mentioned in there is age aware that you're getting older and maybe the um, 
maybe the window is closing. Um, and so that's connected with um, any time that you've decided that it's time to move on, it's time to move on to a different stage and close this chapter and it didn't resolve the way you were hoping to. That's another kind of process where we're not just talking about um, grieving a particular loss, but it's the loss of a whole a, a, a whole dream and a whole trajectory and 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 making peace with that. So um, in there, I think it's a process of a lot of acceptance work around coming to terms with how life doesn't deal us always the 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 first cards that we would have picked. and and how can we how can we be with that? How can we make peace with that? And uh, as as David Kessler talks about, how can we create meaning? that's consistent with the life that we have moving forward. You know, and this whole topic could really be a whole whole workshop in itself. And one day I actually kind of hope to create a program to, to help with this process of moving on when you've decided that it's the closing of a chapter. Um, but like all the rest of these things, I think that, you know, acknowledging that it's really significant for you and finding other people who can relate and really understand and not reassure you with statements that are not helpful, you know, well, be grateful for what you have and pithy little statements that really just don't help you um, take care of you know, your, your heart. Um, uh, but, you know, the, the long game strategies that I teach, I think really help us to be resilient for the whole range of challenges that we might face in fertility and beyond. And actually somebody shared just yesterday, I had a live session with the members in my Conceive with Ease program. And it was interesting, you know, toward the end, uh, somebody said, you know, it seems like we're discovering a lot of connections of how these tools help with, with help us in life in general. And maybe that's that this whole fertility challenge is just a carrot on the stick that has led us to be motivated to learn and practice these things. And they were sharing that, you know, a lot of what we end up talking about in the program is how this applies in all realms of life. So to me, that's like the bonus. If you come to learning these strategies because you are motivated by uh, the, the desire to uh, manifest a, another child in your life, and on the way, you get a whole bunch of strategies that help you with all the different stages of life, the challenges that might happen in life. That is, uh, that's just a really wonderful bonus. So these principles are going to help you through all of the different types of challenges that you might grapple with. Um, and in particular, on the short term, this issue of the 28-day cycle where we have repeated. Uh, somebody said, I go through the five stages of grief every month, up and down through all this. And I found that this acceptance-based approach and um, learning to work with our emotions to balance them out really helps get people off of that emotional roller coaster. So if you have an interest in pursuing this more within my programs, just be aware that the seven day TTC chill out challenge is coming up on Monday after next it's starting and enrollment is going to open on Tuesday um, for that. It's going to be open Tuesday through Friday. Um, if anybody's watching this on the replay and we're like in next month or something, know that this is a program I'm going to likely continue offering about every eight, six to eight weeks, maybe every two months. Um, so you can always sign up on the wait list to be sure that you're going to be notified. And also, I let people on the wait list come in a day early to make sure that you get a spot. It's starting to become more popular, and I'm going to not have it blow up into a challenge with a 1,000 people because I don't think I can help a 1,000 people at the same time. I'm good, but I, I'm just trying to be realistic here. <laughs> I want to have a more personal touch. So if you are interested in this program and you want to make sure you're first in the door, you can sign up on the wait list. And I need to put a link to that in this. So uh, you can find all this stuff on my website at www.fertilityfromthesoul.com. And I'd like to see if there are any questions about anything. Ha has this been helpful to you? Um, what, uh, what 
what's something that you're going to take away from this session? I'd love to hear about how this experience being on this live stream with me. Oh my gosh, how long has it been? Almost an hour and a half. Some of you I'm sure have popped in and out, but let me know um, what you might take away that will help you on your path. And um, is there, are there any questions that you are hoping to have answered that I didn't answer yet? Um, your personal touch makes the whole program so lovely. Thank you, Andrea. I have had visions of wanting to reach thousands and thousands of people. And I guess that's what my YouTube channel does. You know, that's the big numbers go there. People pop in and get to listen to the affirmations and stuff. And there's 6,000 subscribers now, which is awesome. But my heart really is in personally connecting with people who are going through stuff. I love doing one-on-one -on -one therapy. I can't do one-on-one -on -one and reach a thousand people. But now in this group program, I can reach, you know, a hundred people or 200 people. So I do like to keep things a little bit more personal so that I can get to know people and guide them in a little bit more personal way. Um, anybody, any questions? I want to um, wish everybody just a lot of heart care through all of this. Um, heart care and courage. I know somebody had commented, it's scary to open up your heart again. And she's noticing her walls are going up. And that's understandable. And that's okay. It's okay if sometimes you, want, you need to just close up and protect your heart a little bit. Don't give yourself a hard time about it. It's okay to kind of like open and close. This is uh, this is not for the faint of heart. You know, there's going to be lots of challenges. And I encourage you to find places where you can connect with people who you resonate with, who are kind of on the same wavelength with you. Where, Because again, like I said, it's the suffering alone that's the deepest suffering. We can have a really hard time, but if we feel connected with others and understood, that makes it something that we can thrive through. So that's my wish for all of you. I hope that all of your dreams come true. And I hope that you, no matter which direction this pathway leads, you will thrive through it and you will be able to embrace all the beauty that is around you. You will be able to um, let tears flow when painful things happen, but that you will feel connected. You won't feel alone and you'll know that there is always support for you and there's always hope and possibilities for each new day ahead. Thank you so much for joining me today. I look forward to staying connected with you.